one of the reasons why we're giving this talk today is because we're working on a pamphlet on the topic of trans liberation and um, what socialists uh, should be talking about on the topic. Um, you can look forward to that pamphlet hopefully being published in the fall of this year. Keep your eyes peeled. It's going to be great. But here, we're going to give a little bit of a, of a taste of, of what's to come. A sneak preview. A sneak preview. <laughs> um, another reason why we're, we're talking about this uh, now is because uh, we've seen in the Netherlands, but also in the UK and the US, a huge rise in transphobia uh, over the past years or the past uh, decade. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, very recently, uh, as a kind of like consequence or example of this, a, uh, a new law concerning trans people, so it's often called the transgender law, uh, <laughs> was taken off of the table, was taken uh, out of uh, um, uh, the debates going on in the parliament. Um, and I think the way that this went is very interesting and kind of indicative of how uh, developments have been going. So first, when this law was introduced uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was careful agreement from some centrist parties. Uh, there was some, a lot of questions, but there was kind of, you know, the tone was mild. But throughout the discussions that have been going on, the far right really got its foot in the door and was spreading a lot of um, falsehoods about uh, uh, the reality of, of, of being trans, um, and this party, the NSA, the New Social Contracts, kind of used the trick now to, to stop the law from being discussed fully, to take it off the table fully. Um, and so now what we kind of see is that it's not just the right-wing parties that are against, but also the cen center party, so-called, like the NSA, who are also speaking out against it. And in doing so, they are citing the safety of women as a concern to take that law off the table. Now the question is, how did we get there and what does this mean? That's what I'm gonna be talking about a little bit in my part of the talk. I'll be talking about the relationship between transphobia and the far right and how it's instrumentalized. Um, and then after that, I'm gonna pass it over to Max for some reflections on different theories in the left on how to fight transphobia and how to struggle for a trans liberation socialist kind of perspective. Um, so maybe very shortly, I don't know if there's anyone here who doesn't know what, it, what transgender kind of means. No, I think I can maybe skip over that part a little bit. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I think what we've seen is that there's been a bit of a societal movement um, over the past, like, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so where uh, there was more visibility for uh, trans and non-binary identities. Um, there was also in a lot of institutions, I think, very careful kind of starting of like acceptance and kind of inclusivity for these identities. Um, and I think the transgender law wasn't kind of example of, of, of that, where what it would have done is it would have made it easier for trans people to change their gender markers in their passports, for example, from male to female or from female to male. Um, whereas now what you need is an expert statement, so you need um, a psychologist who you, or a psychiatrist, I think, who you pay uh, to give the statement that you are in fact trans, whereas you saying I want to change my gender markers is not enough. Um, so the new law would have been about this, it, wasn't, it wouldn't even be about like how easy it is to, to go into medical transition, for example, it's just about like a kind of a bureaucratic thing, which uh, then proves to be kind of an issue uh, which the far right can mobilize or can use to start kind of spreading transphobic ideas. Um, and that's mainly what I want to talk about. So what is this transphobic kind of backlash that, that has come up um, in response to this kind of maybe increased visibility of trans people? On the one side, there's like kind of societal attitudes that contain a lot of transphobia. Um, we see this also in Parliament with, for example, Thierry Baudet, who denies that non-binary people even exist, or people like Hirt Wilders, who call all of this a kind of gender craze, gender wahnsinn, he calls it. Um, uh, or, for example, think of uh, the singer Anouk, who started posting transphobic <laughs> statements on her on her social media. Um, these societal attitudes or social attitudes are kind of spreading more. 
there's also structural issues in which um, transphobia is kind of expressed. And I think one really important one for a lot of trans people is the accessibility of healthcare, where uh, due to very long waiting times and very high levels of gatekeeping, uh, healthcare is very difficult for trans people to, um, to get. Um, after years of waiting, if you're non-binary or if you're neurodiverse, it's still going to be very difficult to actually be listened to and get the care you need. Um, for trans kids, this, there's extra barriers also. Um, all of these problems are, are big ones and they're political problems, right? They're not kind of due to a natural state of being, but it's due to funding issues. Um, also, other structural issues is that the legal rights for trans people are not very extensive. For example, group insults to trans people is not criminalized. It is for many other groups, but not for trans people. Um, and until, I forget the year now, I think it was 2014 or 15, trans people um, were forced to get sterilized if you wanted to change your gender marker in your passport, which is, I mean, it's just gruesome. It's, it's, it's uh, disgusting that that happened in you know the Netherlands, which <laughs> thinks of itself as such a progressive and inclusive country for queer people. Forced sterilization is also part of that, apparently. <laughs> um, right, so according to kind of statistics, uh, violence in the streets and online against trans people has also been increasing in the past years. Um, and we need to really understand this in relation to the far right who's actively weaponizing transphobia as a kind of wedge is issue to drive apart the left and to create divisions in the working class as a whole. Um, a lot of the issues that are kind of raised by uh, transphobes, as I said earlier, interestingly, a lot of this kind of uh, relates to the supposed danger for uh, women, and specifically cis women, that trans people, and specifically trans women, would pose. Um, and there's a lot of lies that are spread in this context. Um, one very common one is about uh, the lies of the danger of trans people in public toilets. Um, this was also the inspiration for the title of our talk, Go Biss Girl. Um, <laughs> uh, because it is claimed somehow, for some reason, that trans women would secretly kind of just be men who are rapists who want to get into uh, women's spaces in order to do harm to the cis women there which is a, a complete fantasy. Um, in reality, actually, it's the other way around. It's trans people who are much more likely to be assaulted in toilets, much more likely to be bullied in school sports teams, for example, much more likely to be sexually assaulted in prisons when uh, often trans people are put in a prison uh, with people from the uh, gender that they were assigned at birth and not the one that they live as, which uh, causes very unsafe situations. Um, right, so that was the go piss girl thing. We want a world in which all women and all people can piss freely and safely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, <laughs> right, so... Um, very quickly, I wanted to touch on the sports example because it's also something that in the Dutch parliament people love to talk about. Um, it's often claimed that trans women would have kind of like an unfair advantage due to having testosterone in their body and therefore their, um, their uh, results in sports would be better somehow. Um, I think there's a general issue with this argument, which is kind of that uh, it's clear that this is not real like that this isn't actually based on that reason because they also use it for chess <laughs> arguments uh, so unless you know you think that women are just dumber than men <laughs> then uh, you have no uh, reason to make that arguments but uh, aside from that it's also very iffy to say that trans women would have uh, blanket advantages over over cis women um, one is because hormone replacement therapy is very effective in kind of changing the hormone levels in your body to uh, be very similar to that of uh, other women or cis women. Um, you know, there's studies about this stuff um, which kind of show there's no metric to say there's a general advantage. There's sometimes parts where trans women are better, sometimes parts where cis women are better. But in general, of course, everyone has a different body. Um, there's also cis women who have very high testosterone levels. It's very unfair to kind of put uh, trans people on 
kind of like the firing line for this issue, which is, isn't really related to trans people, really. It's more about how do we, uh, yeah, how we do sports, I think. Um, anyway, so these kinds of issues are very often kind of used by what uh, we like to call TERFs, Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist, that's an acronym. Um, ah, five minutes of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, okay, do we all know what TERFs are? Yeah. Okay, I'll skip over. <laughs> um, right, so we know about, they have very like, you know... Yeah, this is some, some very um, bio-essentialist ideas about what it means to be a man or a woman. And the, the interesting thing is that uh, they claim to be feminist, but it usually just comes down to the idea that women are inherently weak victims and uh, also kind of dumb, usually. So, um, kind of funny how they say that. So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over to the far right, because that's what I really want to talk about. Um, in the Netherlands, I think we see that a lot of far-right groups have taken over these kind of arguments from TERFs, but they usually drop the kind of safety of women and replace it with like the safety of children or the safety of the moral fabric of society and the white family or whatever. Um, so in the Netherlands, whereas in the UK, we see a real TERF kind of movement where they even like kind of t find purchase in the left. Um, even sometimes groups, they call themselves Marxists. Um, in the Netherlands, we're not at that point. We see that there are some like explicitly turf demonstrations. They, they're called Let Women Speak. But the people who mainly show up there are either far right, like Burger Beweging, FED, or uh, Nazis, straight up. Um, the issue is that um, the far right is very effective in spreading these ideas. And one of the ways I think we need to understand these ideas is that they have a logic of um, dividing the working class along its lines in order to break our collective power. Um, that's, I think, we're going to get a little bit into like how capitalism and, and, and transphobia are related, but not so much. So uh, we have a lot to talk about. So just very quickly, I think what I wanted to convey is that it's in the interest of the ruling class to divide the working class uh, amongst all lines that they can kind of uh, find. Uh, also along gendered lines, um, but how this division, what it's exactly based on and, and how it works historically is a whole question that we can't really get into. Um, but I hope for now it's enough to kind of see that um, the far right kind of functions as kind of like a weapon for the ruling class by driving this divide and conquering strategy through lines of oppression and marginalization of any community. This can be, of course, compared immediately to the strategy of how the far right treats migrants in the Netherlands and Wilders, how he blames all the ills of austerity and, for example, the housing uh, uh, issues on migrants. Um, I think in the Netherlands it's kind of interesting because our far right, like with um, Pim for Time, <coughs> kind of really used this homo-nationalist narrative and he was kind of like, oh, we'll keep the Muslims out because they're a threat to our, uh, our gays. Um, and this, this, this continues, unfortunately. Um, this is a strategy that works quite well now also with driving a wedge between the rest of the queer community and the trans, uh, and trans people. Um, and yeah, the logic is kind of like an isolated social group is going to be weaker than one who stands united with the whole queer community. So then targeting trans people it's kind of like what we have to see is, is that's the first step for the far right. Um, and once you know trans people are sufficient, sufficiently marginalized, then the whole queer community can, can be next. And I think um, that's also why this turf ideology is so kind of self-defeating, because it's like kissing the boot of the people who see you as nothing more mm. than an incubation machine. <laughs> and um, you know, they, they have no issues uh, with uh, getting rid of abortion rights, for example, which uh, you think that a radical feminist should be very much in favor. Um, right, so it's in this kind of targeted attack that's uh, um, pretty coordinated throughout the far right. They managed to influence the public narrative in bourgeois media who are more than happy to kind of uh, reproduce their ideas. Think of the NRSA, who has this running kind of uh, transphobic column. Um, but they also easily spread these kind of conspiratorial 
claims um, about how trans people would all kind of be rapists and unsafe. Um, and they put those arguments kind of on the same ground as, as an equal in, in a debate with trans people about their rights, which is in a way very criminal, but it's very normal in the debate. It's what the debate looks like right now. Um, and aside from the, as I said, rising kind of violence in the streets, this also has consequences for the legal status of trans people, um, which the transgender law can, kind of was a good example of, even though that law maybe was not like the biggest one in terms of improving life quality, it definitely made things easier and would have been nice. Um, but uh, it's really this, this, this coordinated attack of the far right by spreading these lies that caused this, this law to be taken off the table. So they're quite uh, effective as you can kind of see. And now also the center, like groups like the CDA, um, rather than use the kind of like maybe fear mongering arguments as much, they would use arguments about how trans kids are just confused. And then they say like, oh, but you know, they need good care. They shouldn't just change their gender marker. They need good care before they make a decision like that. But explain how that's absolutely bullshit because has, have they ever put any effort into the kind of like improving the lacking uh, trans health care that there is that's causing kids to have to wait three years and having to go through an excruciating, excruciating puberty before they can get help? No, that's something that hasn't been changed for over, or it's been a problem for over 15 years and it has not been addressed. Um, so ending now to pass over to Max. Um, sorry. <laughs> not only are we kind of fa faced with a growing violent far right movement, uh, but this inaccessibility of healthcare is also driving trans people to despair and societal acceptance is decreasing. So we can kind of see that uh, progress and, and inclusivity for trans people is not like a straight line towards things getting better, but the fight for trans liberation is one that needs to be struggled for more than ever. <laughs> uh -huh. Liberate the bumblebee. Yeah. <laughs> bumblebee, go! Be free! Oh, no, no! <laughs> hey! Oh, yeah. oh. Oh. This will make for great, uh, kind of like, uh, part of the recording. We're like, ah! Oh. Oh. Wow, so enlightening! <laughs> We, we'll have a short break while the comrades are taking care of the bumblebee, right? Yes. Yeah, this is wrong. Yeah. That's the fight that we're looking at. No, no, no. I was just like engaged. Is the bumblebee liberated? Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. yeah, but there's also noise out there. Yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Thank you, Ian. Uh, a little bit of applause is always good, extra applause. So um, I have the task of um, uh, talking to you about some of the kind of like dominant theories on the, on the like broad left, I think, and how um, conversations about kind of how to fight transphobia and how to fight for the liberation of oppressed people in general um, are being had and uh, uh, also critique them from a Marxist perspective. So this might be the controversial part of the meeting, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, because I think for us, of course, for anyone struggling um, to fight oppressions such as transphobia, but also racism and sexism, the question of where oppression comes from and who benefits from it, and most importantly, how do we overcome it and rid society of these kind of forms of, of, of oppression and discrimination must be central. And I think part of our tradition is arguing for a lot of politics that's rooted in uh, the belief or the assertion I would say that there is collective power of our class, of the working class, and that we can change society for the better, right? Um, and that, um, okay, and that um, that uh, we don't need to accept capitalism and hide away in like liberated spaces or kind of like say we'll make the best of it and kind of split off into kind of like small communities where we take care of each other. I mean that can be very nice, but the question is, does that actually lead us to collective liberation? Um, and, you know, I want to argue that we can actually fight the system and smash it for collective benefit. Um, I would say that there's a lot of uh, good phrases that we see often. For example, the whole system needs to go and smash, smash the heterosexist, white supremacist patriarchy. And I think, you know, you see that a lot on Twitter and on Instagram. And I think that's a very positive uh, uh, thing. That's a very positive sentiment, of course. 
Um, but I would also say that the theories and the organizational practices of much of the left uh, um, are not really lining up with this declared goal. So often the question is kind of like, yes, but how, right? I think this is the, that's the more complicated question than just saying we need to smash it. Um, and uh, I think for much of the kind of queer feminist left um, and the progressive left, attempts to answer these questions have resulted in a focus on multiple closely related concepts that come out of um, the academic theory of postmodernism, and they are privilege theory, queer theory, and identity politics. Um, and I think these theories have been removed so far from the academic roots that for many people, they're just kind of accepted as the truth, like we are just, um, like this is how things are, and people don't even realize that they're kind of like coming out of a certain political tradition. Um, and for the vast, yeah, and uh, I think there are some things to be said about them, and uh, Marx's critique um, kind of from a revolutionary socialist perspective. Um, but of course, it's also important to say that, like I've already said about the statements online, it is a very well-intentioned and positive development that people say we need to fight for a better world. Um, and also, like if I critique these kind of things now, uh, I want to say that, like of course, any attack of the far right on kind of like wokeness or their kind of like caricature of what they call identity politics, while they're themselves <laughs> super complicit in in a set of like just far right <laughs> identity politics needs to be rejected by us and we need to like stand together as a left and say this is not what we stand for. But I also think there needs to be space on a kind of inner left conversation on like dealing with how do we respond to these things, what do we criticize about it, and I think this is the attempt in a kind of like what I presume to be a left space here, right? <laughs> um, uh, so um, let's think about, uh, yeah. I would say let's start at the history of uh, identity politics. Um, so identity politics, I would say, is a collection of strategies and analyses that center on the experiences and identities of marginalized and oppressed people. Typically, identitarians, as I will call people that subscribe to this now, approach the development and strengthening of identities as of the oppressed as a kind of like the primary objective of struggle, right? So. Uh, strengthening identities and strength, strengthening a kind of like pride and self-identification is in itself often seen as a form of struggle. Historically, the set of politics was born in the 1960s and 70s. It grew out of the feminist and the black liberation movements, and it was especially kind of uh, dominated by university-educated students. Um, one of the first, more significant uses of the terminology of identity politics was certainly in the Cumberhee River Collective Statement of 1977. 1977, yes, um, in which uh, they say, uh, they define identity politics as a focus on, I quote, upon our own oppression and the belief that the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. Similarly, in the feminist movement, um, there was a manifesto published by Beverly Jones and Judith Brown, which was called Towards a Female Liberation Movement, which is kind of a key text of uh, the feminist movement of the time, where they say people don't get radicalized fighting other people's struggles. Women must form their own groups and work primarily with each other for female liberation. Um, in he many ways, I think these conclusions seem very counterintuitive from, to the lessons from the period, from the 60s and 70s, because we saw a radicalization of huge layers of people, I think, uh, in the struggle against US imperialism, it, the Vietnam War, uh, against racism and colonialism. Um, and I think similarly now we see that like thousands and tens of thousands of people are radicalized uh, in the struggle for Palestine and Palestinian liberation, right? Uh, which is not, I mean, it is affecting all of us, but it is, I think, a bit further removed than, you know, not, not uh, yeah, I think you get my point. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the kind of lessons that this was coming, uh, that was drawn from this kind of focus on our own identities is very much also coming out of a weak left in this period. Uh, there was Stalinism and the Red, Red Scare in the United States and actually across Euro Europe as well. Uh, Stalinist communist parties often dismissed the struggle of marginalized people, uh, kind of saying that these are kind of like things that will just kind of fall away automatically after the revolution. We don't need to focus on that now. Uh, unions and labor parties were really chauvinistic and focused on completely like economic demands. So there was not a lot that the left had to offer for marginalized and oppressed people. Um, uh, out of this resulting kind of frustration, I think grew a defeatism and a separatism of people saying, you know what, if they don't want to work with us, we'll do our own thing, which is understandable in many ways. 
Um, so radical feminists, for example, developed ideas of uh, political practice of women-identified women. It's also called political lesbianism, where you say you have to cut ties with all men because men are fundamentally the oppressor. Um, and what we have to do is actually turn towards women. And the only non-oppressive sex that we can have is with other women. Uh, so it was a political choice to become a lesbian in a way. Um, uh, and uh, of course, you know, these, these kind of like things that there were many kind of forms of this across the left. Um, by the late 80s, queer activists asserted that queer liberation must fun fundamentally be about politics of separation, away from demands of kind of like all of society needs to change. And it was more drawn towards personal liberation, personal coming out, personal kind of like new ties, new ways of living together, these kind of things. And with this move also came a rejection of seeing capitalism and class society as a source of racism, of sexism, of queer oppression. And instead, the frame was more on men, white people, straight people, etc., as the primary responsible and like benefiters of these systems. And that is not to say, of course, that the way that we experience these things is not, you know, trans people will experience transphobia through cis people, and gay people will experience homophobia through straight people, uh, but the kind of question is really who's at the bottom line responsible and what, who, who are benefiting from these systems? Is it really um, cis people? Is it really straight people? Um, so um, queer theory was also kind of attached to this, and it's, of course, I'm bringing this up because it's kind of, I think, seen as more coming out of the, uh, the trans community or the queer community, um, and it was really built out of that. Uh, it's a branch of postmodern and post-structuralist academic theories. Uh, it was developed by people like Michel Foucault and Judith Butler, who's very popular. Um, also, a lot of good stuff there, but I think also that stuff to be criticized. Um, Butler is, of course, credited, for example, with the development of the concept of performativity of gender. So, well, let's not get into that, maybe in the discussion. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think these theoretical approaches share a lot of commonalities in Marxism in their starting position, right? So we. Both us and queer theorists, for example, say gender, sexuality, these things are not immovable constants throughout all of history, but they change depending on the time that we're in, where we are, the culture that we're in, all of these kind of things, right? Marxists completely agree with that. But I think the, we differ on the kind of question of like, where did these, how did these things develop, right? Why do we have a gender binary, for example, in this part of human development, in this part of the world? And uh, also, how do we overcome them? What is this theory of social change? Um, and what a lot of these theories often focus on, this is about queer theory, but I would say this is also kind of seen in, in the other things that I've talked about, is uh, it has a high kind of focus on linguistics, right? There's an assertion that the way that we understand the world is kind of coded through the use of language. And if we change language, we can also overcome certain levels of oppression. And again, I think some nuance, language is important, and I think we definitely need to think about it, uh, but we also need, I think, to you know, go beyond that and kind of think about, well, why are we, talk, why are we talking the way that we talk, right? And where do these kind of structures come from and these patterns come from? Yes, five minutes. Mm. Well. Um, also, um, uh, there's often a kind of uh, uh, a critique on binaries, which I think is very much welcome in the in the sphere of gender. Um, but then this kind of this critique of gender binaries kind of uh, often extended towards the critique of binaries in general. So there's a claim that actually reality is infinitely more complicated, uh, that there's as many paths to liberation as there are people or groups. Um, it's basically coming out of this idea that the grand narratives about trying to explain society as a whole and the history of society as a whole, which Marxism does claim to or that, that, that we think we do, um, is, is kind of like old and outdated and it's too binary and that we need to kind of like, uh, you know, for example, also the, the kind of like bourgeoisie versus proletariat thing, that it's too uh, simplified. And in some ways it is simplified, but I think it is showing the kind of like the general tendencies of clashes in society, right? Of course you can divide it up the question is kind of like, what are the fundamental mechanisms here? Um, Butler also coined a concept called politization through objection, which suggests that by merely existing, um, the most marginalized can kind of instigate social transformation. So, um, you know, just by existing, you're kind of a part of the resistance and you can change the system. And 
as much as I would like to say, hell yeah, um, I think the reality is often that that is not enough to actually lead to systemic change, right? And we need to do more and we need to get organized. And what often these approaches do is that there's a kind of like a focus on uh, people who uh, have certain identity, identities or experiences and it kind of like almost creates a idea of with these experiences you kind of get a knowledge on how to fight and overcome the system which is a huge oversimplification in many ways and it's also seen whole groups of people as a monolith right so all people of color have one experience and they all come to one conclusion all trans people have one experience and they come to one conclusion and it's often I think yeah massively oversimplifying the issue and it's kind of like shifting the focus of kind of uh, we know you know saying we need collective processes uh, of a kind of diverse working class fighting against capitalism towards we need individuals standing up proud and strong which I want people to stand up proud and strong I hope I can stand up proud and strong but it's not enough to overcome capitalism right and to really fight for our liberation um, okay we have a couple of minutes left <clears throat> Um, okay, one of the things I still want to talk about is, um, it's, it's kind of connected to this, is a theory of, uh, it's called privilege theory, which is also very popular and very much seen as kind of like the standard, as in, it's a, a rule of nature, which is an, a theory that explains how transphobia, how sexism, how racism works primarily through uh, saying that there's a kind of system of privileges that are given to majority groups in society, right? Um, so. The Peggy McIntosh, who was a scholar who came up with this, uh, or one of the scholars who came up with this, said it's like an invisible backpack that people are given, where they're kind of like given little benefits uh, based on their position in society. Um, but again, it is often kind of focusing on interpersonal behaviors, right? Rather than seeing, for example, um, the, uh, the unsafety of trans people on the street at night as something that's an expression of a violent system of transphobia it's kind of seen as a benefit given to cis people when the reality is that like what cis people are experiencing is, is something that is not necessarily given to them at the expense of trans people but it's something that's pushed into society in a systemic level as a transphobic narrative right and the thing is not that we want to lower cis people here and say we take away your privilege, <laughs> but actually we say we want to like up everybody, right? I'm describing it a bit crudely here because I'm on one minute left. <laughs> um, we can get into that more in the discussion. But it's a, again, it's a bit about like, I think as a left, we need to think about who is fundamentally benefiting from these things. And I would say that, for example, men, it, it's an easy claim to say, I think it, it feels very intuitive to say, for example, all men benefit from the oppression of women. Um, but if you, if you kind of look at it on a fundamental level, the wage that's taken away from the woman, is that really given to the man, or is it put in the pockets of the capitalist, right? Again, a kind of a crude example. But I think you're kind of getting, where, getting at what I'm saying here, is that we need to, I think, be a bit more critical about, yeah, who is to blame and who do we need to attack? And there is a danger, I think, of us kind of like starting to point at each other more. Uh, than, than like taking our fingers and point together at the capitalist system, which should never be an excuse, of course, to say we don't talk about transphobia uh, or we don't talk about racism. These things need to absolutely be um, uh, addressed, uh, criticized, attacked, uh, also in the left. Uh, but I think the kind of question is, when it comes to a moment of class struggle, uh, where do we push and who do we push against? Um, I'm, uh, I've won the... Um, <laughs> I think, let me quickly uh, give me one extra minute. I think um, in a Marxist framework, again, we can talk about this a bit more in the end. We say that the working class has a collective power and the working class is trans and is also cis and is white and also black and is, you know, it has, it is an incredibly diverse class with an incredible amount of knowledge and experiences. And I think that the point is that we have a collective power and there's this kind of old socialist saying, which is an injury to one is an injury to all. This is something that we really need to apply and work with beyond just recognizing kind of intersections. Because often what we say is we're going to start listing all of the intersections, which is very good. But then the question is, okay, why are they there and how do you fight them, right? And um, that is, I think, needs to be more than just kind of coming together. It needs to be coming together and fighting together. And I, yeah, I, I hope that this uh, kind of like puts up my fingers. Thank you.